Uh, my name is Rob Latef. I just completed my uh, Master of Arts in uh, International Studies uh, and did the co-major in Environment and Natural Resources. So I'm going to be shifting gears just a little bit, but keeping with the theme of development and success. But what I'm going to be talking about is sustainable energy development. Now, coming into the program, uh, I wanted to um, find out if there were, if, if a place existed where they had successfully implemented um, a renewable energy initiative. And if they had, if they were able to completely make the transition away from fossil fuels. And I did find uh, one such a place uh, in uh, Denmark. Um, it's a little island uh, in between. Uh, if you were to look at Denmark, um, you have the big peninsula. It's in the middle of the, the Kattegat Sea. Um, small community, just barely 4,000 people who live there. Uh, it's traditionally known for uh, agriculture and tourism, um, but it quietly, sort of w without notice, even within the country, uh, made this transition and completed it uh, in 2007. Um, and the project uh, eventually became known as the Energy Island Project. Uh, and they did it primarily through um, the use of uh, land-based and offshore wind turbines. So I'm sure that all, you know, we're all familiar with that here. <clears throat> and uh, the reason they did that was because they wanted to do it uh, with readily available technology that they could do off the shelf uh, to see if it was in fact possible to make the transition. Uh, another unique thing about this project is that it is community owned. Uh, it got very little funding from outside sources. Uh, a lot of that funding, if it did come from an outside source, was primarily in the form of, a, for instance, through the national government uh, supplied monies for drawing up the plan, but not actually to buy the technology with. Uh, so to give you an idea um, of that, 10-year project. Uh, I made a timeline which shows sort of the, um, the process of implementation. Uh, it began first um, with a small office to inform the local community of what was going on, um, to give them a place where they could go to and get information about the project, and uh, basically say, well, you know, like, well, I'd, I'd like to find out more about becoming involved. So that was the first step. And then uh, they began implementing the onshore turbines in about 2000 uh, and slowly um, built it up over the course of the next few years and completed it whenever they began selling energy back to the mainland in 2007. So essentially what I did was I went into this community and to give you an idea, these are the, the turbines. These are actually located on one of the local farms uh, that the, whenever they were doing the um, sort of the community roundtable saying, well, where do you think we should have this? You know, it was open to everybody on the island and everyone could come in and say, well, I don't think we should have it here for one reason or another. And then uh, some of the local farmers said, well, you can put it on our land. We have all of this open area that we can use and all we do is graze our cattle out here. So you can put it there. Uh, some of the farmers own some of the wind turbines. This one here in particular is owned by this particular farmer. And then the other ones are owned through things uh, like community co-ops. Some are owned by the municipality. Um, and it's just, uh, it really, it didn't take any one form. Uh, it was a, a number of different ways that it happened. And this here is one of the uh, heat plants, a community heat plant uh, that they use uh, to circulate heat, uh, heated water through some of the, the local districts. And so what people do is they would buy into it, uh, and these are community owned as well. Um, if they wanted to tie into it, they could have their houses modified and tie into that system. And uh, the reason I wanted to look at this is because uh, it was an actual real world scenario where I could go and say, uh, what happened here and is it possible to do it in other places? Um, it also helps uh, fill some of the gaps in research that is more theoretical in does, it's saying, well, this is the way things could happen or this is the way things should happen. Um, this says, well, this is the way that it actually does happen at a community level, you know, um, from the bottom up. <clears throat> um, 
this is also good for uh, smaller, smaller rural communities because this was a rural farming community. Um, and they were able to do this successfully. Um, I won't say that there weren't any problems in it, but they overcame those problems. And I think that that can serve as an example for other communities wishing to do the same. They face some of the problems that other communities, uh, which are rural, agrarian, uh, sometimes they're facing declines in population and things like that, which um, even though this is a particular community weren't problems that were unknown on a larger scale. Uh, and at the most basic level, in order for any kind of sustainable development to happen, there has to be inputs of energy, um, which is sustainable as well. I mean, you can't build sustainable development on conventional sources of energy because sometimes in the near future, those sources of energy might possibly run out. Uh, for my field work, uh, I spent two months on the island interviewing uh, 24 community members who were um, involved with the project. Some were just community members who lived there during the time of the project's implementation. They were from various uh, occupations, as you can see here. Uh, there's more than 24 individuals here because there was some overlap. Some people actually had more than two jobs. Uh, they might. Um, be retired but still working as a contractor in some way, shape, or form on the island. I also participated in local community events uh, to get a feel for um, what life was like on the island. And I also went through the historical documents that were, um, that were available and uh, related to the project. And uh, the foundations that I used to conduct this study were of sustainable development and community development. Uh, which the most basic um, understanding of what sustainable development is, is the use of resources um, in the present, which will not take away from future generations as well. Um, and community development at, it, at its most basic is uh, the, the betterment of uh, a community. And to, to link these two, I use the concept called capacity building, uh, which is essentially um, the the, the utilization of uh, community resources in the forms of uh, skills, knowledge, talents, and those kinds of things of individual people within the community. And to guide my research, um, I basically said, how does, how does sustainable energy development happen at the community level? And what social factors influence this particular project? And what I found was, is um, sort of a, a multi-level uh, arena of actors within this one particular project. The ones at the local level had the most agency, but there were other actors uh, such as the Danish government, the European Union, uh, and the local council, which all worked in conjunction to make this project happen. Um, it was sort of uh, initiated at um, the, the middle level of the central government, well, I guess that would be one of the higher levels, but it was uh, realized at the local level through the initiative of local community members. And digging deeper into the community, I found some things that uh, I believe contributed to the success of this. One was uh, strong community social networks. Uh, people were very engaged with their community. Uh, these pictures here show um, a particular event, which was not uncommon. These events would happen about once every two weeks or so on the island, especially during the summertime. Um, and this was not necessarily for the benefit of people who were just coming to vacation on the island. This was for people who lived on the island. And as, uh, when I asked about this, I said, well, is it always like this? Um, does it die down in the wintertime when the vacationers go away? They say, no, it actually picks up in the wintertime. Because at that time, the vacationers are gone, we all go to each other's homes, and it's very important that we interact with each other. Otherwise, you would be, it was a very lonely place if you don't. Um, I was very surprised um, at the level of trust people had with one another. I would hear over and over again, well, uh, we don't lock our doors. I leave my keys in my car whenever I park it at night. Um, we don't have a problem with theft. And I inquired more about that. And they said, well, we know who everybody is. If somebody steals my car, I can ask my neighbor who it was. And then they stop them at the ferry. And I have my car. Exactly. 
that's exactly it. People were, well, you can't go down the street without seeing somebody you don't know. So it wasn't, um, it, there were very, very low incidents of crime. And if there were, it was usually somebody who was not part of the community itself. It was someone coming from the outside to either vacation there or someone who found their way there one way or another and just, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, was a bit of a troublemaker. And they said that they had a way of dealing with those individuals as well in their own way. They would encourage that person to uh, leave the island, you know, in a, a sort of a, you know, in their own fashion. Um, and it was really, uh, I, I encountered this myself whenever I was doing my field work. I was there um, for maybe three weeks, four weeks, and then I started seeing people who I had, again, I saw people in the supermarket, and, you know, you would say hello, and then uh, after a time, people, you know, started inviting me to their homes. Um, many of the interviews that I conducted was actually sitting around a dinner table with people um, and, you know, just enjoying the, the hospitality of their home. So that's, um, you know, one of the things that surprised me whenever I went here. And I said, well, this, you know, people were very, very familiar with, you know, working together or meeting with each other, so it wasn't something that was alien to them. Uh, this picture here I chose because it was interesting to me. Uh, the, the local farmers there, um, the one, they would sell produce on the island, they would also export it, but when they did sell it, it would be on these little stands here. And you would be expected to just put your money, there's a little money box on top here, you put your money in and take what it is that you pay for. No one monitored how much you took. Um, you were it was the honor system. All across the island, it was not an unusual thing. And uh, it, it was surprising. It's a surprisingly good system in that people don't want to disrupt that, you know, sort of trust. So they adhere to that system. Uh, some other s factors specific to the project that I discovered were um, high levels of leadership and direct participation. Um, I identified one individual uh, continually in my interviews. People would say, "Well, this uh, gentleman, Soren Hermanson, he was responsible for." getting the word out to the public and involving us in it. And he made us feel very welcome in, you know, coming to the meetings. And he was able to explain the uh, technical aspects in a very, very simple way that we could understand it. Uh, and if you ask him, he's like, no, no, I, I didn't have, you know, I didn't have that big a part in it. Um, but that was not what my findings told me. Um, local members, uh, the uh, Council would even say, well, without him, you know, he's our point of contact with this project. He's the one that was able to do what we maybe not were able to. Um, and again, in conjunction with this leadership was uh, they had meeting after meeting. Uh, I think uh, I identified in, in about a, I think a year period, I identified about five or six meetings that they had in a single year dealing with the project, getting off the ground. So um, that was in citing the project, who wanted to be invested in the project, and things like that. And uh, I also identified some surprising effects of the project as well. Before the project was implemented, uh, people in the community were utilizing renewable energy resources like uh, personal windmills, solar panels, and things like that. But after the project was implemented, people either reported themselves uh, that they were um, planning on implementing personal renewable energy projects, or they had seen an increase in it in their neighbors. So it had a, an interesting side effect, aside from just weaning the community itself off of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, they wanted to, it was an identity for the island after that, and they wanted to be a part of that. It also created, uh, in addition to the regular tourism that the island experiences, they also have energy tourism now, uh, where people come to learn about the Energy Island Project, you know, view the different uh, systems that they have in place because they actually conduct tours of the facilities, saying this is what we've done, this is what we use, and this is how it works. Uh, so there's a, a large amount of public outreach, not just within the community, but with the rest of the world as well. There were groups from Taiwan, uh, China, Spain, Italy, uh, let's see, Ireland, just to name a few while I was there that came to view the project. Uh, and it also um, provides a source of income for the municipality now, who, uh, which actually owns uh, five of the offshore windmills. And so that generates an income every year. 
And in Denmark, uh, just recently within the past 10 years, they implemented a law that says if you have an energy or an income generating energy source, you have to use that income and put it back into similar projects. So now they're using the income generated from that project to uh, put electric buses and electric cars and taxis on the island, uh, which was the final part of the project that they weren't actually able to realize. But now that they're hoping to in the second phase, which they're calling SAMHSA 2.0 now. So that's actually, um, it's continuing to go. Now, summing all of this up, um, I was able to identify some capacities, which like I was telling you are those different uh, things that individuals or institutions can uh, lend, uh, which is not always financial. So at the individual level, uh, there was leadership and direct ownership, uh, which were some of the most, uh, that's why it's here at the top, um, some of the most significant ones. And it was supported uh, by organizational capacities from the municipality, uh, from the offices which were created to educate the public and house the information now associated with the Energy Island Project. And at the social level, it's supported by those networks and uh, links of trust between community individuals uh, and creating in total community capacity. Like I was saying, the project is continuing to go and I think it's sort of an, an example of success. It's been um, institutionalized in the form of the SAMHSA Energy Academy. This is the place where people go, like I was saying, those uh, individuals from Spain or Japan, uh, China can go and say, well, you know, what, what is it that you use and how did you do it? And they can go here and learn as much as they want to about it. The Energy Academy gives presentations about the project. They guide the tours. Um, and they also are responsible for um, making sure that the other projects are successful. And that was the one interesting thing here, too, is that energy has been privatized by the community on the island. So this isn't a company, it's a nonprofit organization that now is responsible for making sure that everything is successful with these projects. And the uh, council members that I spoke with, they say, well, the Energy Academy is uh, providing a function that the council is not able to. Just because of manpower and time, we cannot devote to it. So they are the ones that take care of it. It employs about 10 individuals, so it actually created jobs whenever it was, um, whenever it was formed. And uh, the project also, um, in relation to this, created jobs uh, just through the need of you know, making the new systems for the heating, uh, installing the windmills and things like that. Uh, and some of the lessons that I took away from this uh, were that uh, the the political and institutional and financial supports, which I showed you at the beginning with that whole inner workings of those organizations, are necessary, but the local buy-in is what really keeps it going. That is what keeps a project uh, potentially from failing. You can start a project and say, well, here's some money to do it, um, but without the initiative at the local level, then it may sputter out halfway through. Um, they realized from the beginning that this project was not going to happen overnight. They had a very comprehensive master plan and they said, this is how we're going to do it. Whenever they reached a point where they said, well, it's not working the way that we think it's going to, they made adjustments and uh, were able to work within that framework to keep it going. But they had the master plan that they could refer back to and say, well, what are our goals? You know, where is it that we need to be at this at certain set time? Um, like I was saying before, these projects can have um, unintended consequences that are beneficial. Um, true, they can also have consequences which are, are <clears throat> not beneficial, but in this case, they seem to uh, be more beneficial than not. Um, and one of the, um, I, w I wouldn't say uh, that's uh, less, uh, it, it's not, a gloomy scenario, but um, it's one of the things that I found out that is not something that I had planned on was that this is a very stable political situation. And for something like this to occur, um, say in the developing world where you have revolving governments um, and places of uh, unrest, that something like this is probably not going to happen because this did, it was a very, very stable environment that this could occur in. And something like this is very apt to, uh, to fail anyway, 
um, without, um, say, like political unrest and things like that. And as far as recommendations um, that I could take away from this project, the first thing I said is, well, you have to clearly define who is responsible for the project. Um, have a person in charge of the project that is willing to see the project through and uh, isn't necessarily going to say, well, halfway through, I'm not sure that I want to do this anymore. I'm going to hand it off to somebody else now. Um, it doesn't have to be an individual either. It can be a group of people, but as long as they're with it until the project's in, I think that's very important. Um, identifying what a community's strengths are from the beginning, uh, I think, is one of the necessary steps to take. Uh, in this scenario, they did not exactly do that consciously, but they were so hypersensitive of what was happening in their community, they already knew, I can go to this individual if I need said thing to happen. Um, or I can go to another individual if I need somebody who's good with doing this kind of thing. Which is exactly what they did in this case. Um, they were very uh, good about educating the public. They didn't leave anyone in the dark about anything, and nothing was kept secret. Nothing was done behind closed doors. Everyone was involved. So I think just letting people know what's happening. Um, don't make it a mystery as to what's going on, you know, especially if it's something in a person's you know, backyard. And this was quite literally in some people's backyards. Let them know what's happening since it involves them directly. Um, and in conjunction with that, hold open forums and debates. Encourage people to disagree with each other because those are things that need to come up in the beginning. If they come up halfway through or towards the end, that's whenever problems occur and projects get stalled because someone says, well, you know, we didn't consider this in the beginning, so we need to stop the project, reevaluate, and then we can move on from there. Uh, and allowing local investment um, encourages people to become more involved. So well, you can make a little bit of money doing this. Um, this is something that is beneficial for you, and you can actually um, generate an income doing this. I had some individuals tell me, well, this was a very good retirement investment for me. Um, I bought 10 shares in the windmills, and they're making better returns than my retirement account are now. Uh, so that was something that I thought was really encouraging with this. And uh, with that, um, I would just like to say that this was made possible by the College of Arts and Sciences Independent Study Award the Plumber Scholarship from uh, the uh, College of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, the Walter Saunders Study Abroad Scholarship, uh, the Dick and Lynn Cheney Study Abroad Scholarship, and the Birdsong Family Scholarship. And with that, uh, I thank you. Thank you.